Well, peace of Christ to you, Christ Church. It's, it's good to worship with you this morning. Um, I just want to give us a couple reminders. Um, if, if you're looking to worship by giving of an offering, uh, we do have the boxes in back. And there's also a way to do it online if you want to uh, do that electronically. Uh, if you need help to do that, because it sounds weird, it kind of it is scary the first time you figure out how to do that, we can help you figure that out. <laughs> so don't think you have to figure all that out on, by yourself. Also, a couple reminders if you grabbed a weekly. Um, the Christ, Christ Church student ministry is starting up for this summer again. So... We had pandemic and we had to close that down, but we're going to be starting that again. So we're excited that as, as the students are getting out of school for the summer, uh, we're going to be able to hold that uh, student ministry for them here. So that's going to start May the 28th. Um, it's going to be um, one Friday a month. Um, we go from uh, 5.30 to, uh, to 7. Um, and we just really want to enjoy, uh, we really want to hold that out to you. It's just an awesome thing for our kids to do. Myself and my wife, Calla, will be leading that with some, with some volunteers. Um, if you don't have kids yourself, but if you have grandkids or you have nieces and nephews, they don't have to be a part of Christ Church. Um, they're welcome to join uh, and come to that. So if you have any questions, I'd be glad to answer those for you. You can just grab me afterward and I can help you out with that. Uh, because we are going to need some volunteers to bring pizza and pop and things like that to give them a lot of sugar and whatever we can get into them, because that's really good to do with junior hires. <laughs> also, on uh, June the 20th, we have uh, Father's Day. We also are having a child dedication. Uh, that's just an awesome celebration. We just want to encourage you to be there for that Sunday. Uh, it's just great to see uh, God at work in his church, and uh, we just want to really encourage uh, the family here, right? because we have mothers and fathers, but we also have spiritual mothers and fathers, and that's you. And we want you to be a part of this. We want you to keep these mothers and fathers accountable, and we want you to be able to, for you, if you're older, to be able to take them under your wing. I'm a father, Matt Yeski, he's a new father, and we need your help. Uh, so we encourage you to come that day and just offer your encouragement and, and your help. Um, I wanna pray for you, and then uh, Brother Tom is gonna be bringing us the word today. So please pray with me. Father, we thank you so much for this morning. We thank you for all that you are doing. Um, and so we ask that you would open our eyes to the guiding of your Holy Spirit. We ask that you guide us to be obedient. We ask that you would um, reveal your word to us this morning, that we might take joy in your great salvation, that we might um, be led to repentance, in holiness, and following Jesus. God, we ask that your spirit would, would speak through uh, Brother Tom as he speaks to us. Father, we pray all these things in the powerful name of Jesus Christ. Amen. Good morning, Christ Church. Before church, I uh, got the pulpit to the size I liked it. I noticed that uh, John has a way of keeping it kind of low. But did you notice the last time after I preached, he came into the pulpit and he didn't have it at his height? He was looking at it like I saw the panic in his eyes. Let's hope it happens again. <laughs> um, we have the privilege of prayer. And I would like once again to read a prayer. Our Presbyterian friends have a... Uh, a a question and answer that goes like this. What is the chief end of man? In other words, what is the chief purpose? To know God and enjoy him forever. And this prayer is entitled, God Enjoyed. Let's go to him together. Thou incomprehensible, 
but prayer hearing God, known but beyond knowledge, revealed but unrevealed. My wants and welfare drawn, draw me to thee, for thou hast never said, Seek ye me in vain. To thee I come in my difficulties, necessities, distresses. Possess me with thyself, with a spirit of grace and supplication, with a prayerful attitude of mind, with access into warmth of fellowship, so that in the ordinary concerns of life, my thoughts and desires may rise to thee, and in habitual devotion I may find a resource that will soothe my sorrows, sanctify my successes, and qualify me in all ways for dealings with my fellow men. I bless thee that thou hast made me capable of knowing thee, the author of all being, of resembling thee, the perfection of all excellency, of enjoying thee, the source of all happiness. O God, attend us in every part of our arduous and trying pilgrimage. We need the same counsel, defense, and comfort we found at our beginning. Let our religion be more obvious to our conscience, more perceptible to those around. While Jesus is representing us in heaven, may we reflect him on earth. While he pleads our cause, may we show forth his praise. Continuing, continue the gentleness of your goodness toward us, and whether we wake or sleep, let your presence go with us, your blessing attend us. Thou hast led us on, and we have found your promises true. We have been sorrowful, but thou hast been our help. Fearful, but thou hast delivered us. Despairing, but thou hast lifted us up. Thy vows are ever upon us. And we praise thee, O God. Amen. We have the privilege now of coming to the word of God. And I have been assigned the passage from Luke's Gospel, the 8th chapter beginning at uh, verse 22 and reading through verse 25. And is, it is our habit. Uh, and those of you who are watching, uh, join us. And please stand as we read the scriptures. The word of God comes to us. One day he got into a boat with his disciples and he said to them, let us go across to the other side of the lake. So they set out, and as they sailed, he fell asleep. And a windstorm came down on the lake, and they were, filled with, they were filling with water and were in danger. And they went and woke him, saying, Master, Master, we are perishing. And he awoke and rebuked the wind and the raging waves, and they ceased, and there was a calm. He said to them, where is your faith? And they were afraid, and they marveled, saying to one another, who then is this, that he commands even winds and waters, and they obey him? Thus far the reading in God's holy word. May the Lord bless his word. You may be seated. I have um, three aims this morning with you. One is to show that this is a critical passage. It's not throwaway. We read the Bible so in a contemporary fashion that it goes something like this. If it touches me or if it uh, intersects with me, then I'll pay attention. But as for the rest, it's sort of filler material or perhaps throw away. But this is a critical passage. The second thing I want to um, go deal with is that this is a very contemporary question that is coming out of 
this critical passage. And finally, I want to have us be afraid and marvel, even as uh, they did. And I mean the word afraid, because if he can do this, What else can he do? So we have some work in, uh, in front of us. This is the first passage of four miracles that occur that show Jesus to be uh, powerful. And the power is demonstrated over the world, first of all, winds in the wave. And secondly, over the devil. Uh, the next passage has to do with... Uh, demon-possessed man. The, the third um, section has to do with the flesh, the, the lady who touched him, and, and finally over death, he raises someone. And the question is there in the passage, isn't it? Who, who is this? Who is this guy? It all started in Luke chapter 4, when, um, which we've returned to week after week, which I really appreciated because there he read from Isaiah 60. Uh, um, I forget the passage actually, but he read from Isaiah. And, you know, the question has always been, who is this guy? Because he goes ahead and he says, today this has been fulfilled among you. And he sits down and he's done. You want to know the rest of his sermon? Read the passage. If you want to know the rest of his sermon, watch his life. Read it as it unfolds. But the question is always there. Who is this? C.S. Lewis once wrote, and I can't remember where or the exact wording, but I remember the image and I can paraphrase. So this is the Tom Wetzelar version of C.S. Lewis making an observation about Jesus that went something like this. If you knew someone who claimed to be the Christ, the Son of God, you would think them to be mentally unst unstable on the order of someone who claims to be a poached egg or Napoleon Bonaparte. Now maybe you've read C.S. Lewis and you remember that illustration. Think of them as being unstable. Who is this that even the wind and the waves obey? The Apostle Paul understood the question. He faced it on another level in another area. He dealt with the, uh, uh, the issue of the resurrection. He was preaching Christ and uh, here we read of Jesus being Lord over the world, over the devil, the flesh, and death. I mean, that's going to be stuff that we'll be looking at in the future. But the, the, these miracles prove him. And, and, and the, the disciples ask that question, and they're afraid, and they marvel, and, and so on. But in 1 Corinthians chapter 15, which we're going to read a big portion of here uh, coming up, uh, you know, the nagging question is, is there a resurrection And if you have this question of who is this Jesus, if there's no resurrection, it has huge consequences for us. So I'm going to read it, and it'll be up there. I think I'm reading from the New King James Version. What you're reading up there is a little different, perhaps. Um, but that's not a bad thing in and of itself. Beginning at verse 3 in 1 Corinthians 15, the Apostle Paul goes into some rather intriguing things. He says, For I delivered to you, notice this, as of first importance, what I also received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scripture, that he was buried, that he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures, that he appeared to Cephas, then to the twelve, then he appeared to more than 500 brothers at one time, most of whom are still alive, though some of them have fallen asleep. Then he appeared to James, then to all the apostles. Last of all, as to one untimely born, he appeared also to me. 
for I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am, and his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that is with me. Whether then, whether then it was I or they, so we preach, and so you believed. Okay, we preach this Christ. But notice now. Now, if Christ is proclaimed as raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, then our preaching is in vain and your faith is in vain. We are even found to be misrepresenting God because we testified about God that he raised Christ, whom he did not raise, if it is true that the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. If in Christ, if, if in Christ we have hope in this life only, we are of all people most to be pitied. Who is this guy? He's dead where you ought to be pitied. We've put our hope in someone who wasn't raised, if the dead are not raised. But then he says this, but in fact, Christ has been raised from the dead, the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. And he goes on to defend that. It's a critical question. It's a serious question. Because our faith depends on it. This is not a throwaway passage that we've read here, but critical because, you see, he saved his disciples. We're perishing. You don't hear that out of fishermen very often. Fishermen know how to handle a boat, or they ought to. Seriously, they ought to. <laughs> I mean, they go out there. Uh, and and they, they ought to be aware. And Jesus said to them, let's go to the other side of the lake. They get in the boat. He's so comfortable with them, he falls asleep. And a storm comes up. A doozy. You would have thought a fisherman would have felt it in his bones. I feel the weather change. There's some days when the weather's about to change. It's like, oh man. This is no ordinary storm. This isn't something that just happens. It's just, however, that that lake is well known for storms to suddenly appear. And they were being swamped with waves. We are going to die. How many times haven't you seen something like that in Scripture? I was thinking about this from the, from another vantage point. This is this is like the dead uh, the Red Sea crossing. When Israel was brought out, they came up to the Red Sea. They were singing their praises. They, everything was going great. They came up to the water, and then they appeared. The Egyptians. We're going to die. Well, and you know what happened. Uh, the waters parted. But it is interesting that in Psalm 106, it gets recorded this way. In verse 8, nevertheless, he saved them for his name's sake, that he might make his mighty power known. He rebuked the Red Sea also, and it dried up, so he led them through the depths as, the, as through the wilderness. He saved them from the hand of him who hated them and redeemed, redeemed them from the hand of the enemy. The waters covered their enemies. There was none of them left. Then they believed his words, they sang his praise. The Lord rebuked the Red Sea. It 
dried up, and now he rebuked the storm, and it calmed down. Just amazing. And he saved them. And he did it in the way of Psalm 106, that he might make his mighty power known. He had a purpose for this. This is not a throwaway passage. This is a passage that, that gets us to, to, to realize something about this Jesus. I suppose being in the seminary with him in those training years, you, you see miracle after miracle and, and so on. And now you see this. It suddenly takes on a whole new meaning. I was thinking about it from the vantage point of much of surgery today. A guy I know had a kidney transplant. Not that big a deal anymore. It's going fine, working good. We get used to it. Knee transplants, hip transplants. You know, we get used to it. It's, how'd surgery go? Fine, everything, everything's good, hunky-dory. But he did it in order, he did this in order to make his power known. And so here is something that is almost beyond, or, well, it is way beyond ordinary. This isn't just simply healing someone. This isn't something that, that they would normally see. This is where he showed his power. And all of this is recorded, of course, so that we would believe that Jesus is the Son of God and by believing have life in his name. That's what John writes at the end of his gospel with a view to teaching us that we are to hear this, to believe this, to have life in his name. It is a critical question. Don't ignore the passages like this. It is also a contemporary question and, um, and, and that, that, that maybe, I, sh I should have maybe addressed that first, but the contemporary question has to do with something that goes like this. We read the Bible with a view to say, what's in it for me? Rather than to see God and his power, God and his greatness, God to be enjoyed as we prayed, God to, to intersect with our lives on, on his terms and so on, we read it from the vantage point that says, God is someone who ought to provide for me in the way that I would like. Um, so today, people look at this story in the scriptures and they say, well, you know, this is a myth and it was added. This wasn't really part of what happened, but it was added. What we like about Jesus is what he taught. What he did didn't really happen. Well, how do you know it didn't happen? Didn't see it. And we don't see it today. We don't see these things happening. So therefore, it's not possible. It was invented and it was given to make Jesus look bigger than he is. I was, I was thinking of an example of this. In 2011, Japan was hit with a series of tsunamis after a huge earthquake. It devastated city after city after city. And thousands of lives were lost. Why didn't he stop the waves? He could have, but I'm not going to answer and get into all of that. I'm just pointing out that we often look at the scriptures from the point of view that says, if it works for you, that's great. Enjoy. But what you say about Jesus can be no different than what somebody else says about Allah or somebody else says about Buddha. They just have different names. You, you, I hear this all the time. The point is, 
This is a critical question because Christ is showing his power and he is saying that he is God and you are not. And it's a contemporary question because we are saying in our time that we're in the driver's seat and God will do as we say and what we want. We hear it time and again. You've seen the bumper sticker, coexist. <coughs> Excuse me. It's using the different religious symbols of a lot of religions. And the idea is that we are all to just get along. Coexist. Whatever works for you, that's true. Your truth is different than my truth. How you look at this passage might be different than I do, but we're both right because we have to get along. This is not what the passage is about, and this is not what Christ is claiming. But what we do in our time is that we bring Jesus down to the level of an idol, the gods of men. And that's not the claim of the Bible or of the God of the Bible. He is out to make his power known, and he is out to lay claim to you and to your life and to your eternity. We are perishing. Yep, you sure are. I mean, that, that, that was the obvious thing. And he rebuked the wind and the waves. I don't know how he did it. I can envision, in my mind being the way it is, it would be something like this. Knock it off. But it's not to be humorous or anything like that. The point being, he can say it and do it. And he does it to people too. Because he takes people who are in utter riot and rebellion, who storm against him. And he changes them. But in our time, we tell God what to do and what will be, and we're no different than what Satan told Eve and, and Adam in the beginning. You will be like God. You could tell him what to do. And that's not the case. And that's not a glory that Jesus will share. There are two reactions recorded in the passage that are intended for, for, for us. And we, we need to have this as well. Be afraid and marvel. Jesus is God. Fear him. Don't cross him. Don't rob him of his glory. The only way that we are ever going to come to the Father is through him. It's through him. And so he displayed his power, and he did so oftentimes out of love and oftentimes to, to relieve the suffering of the people that he loved. He saw them in their suffering. He saw them as sheep without a shepherd. He saw them so desperate, poor, and he healed them. And often it was amazing. The only way that we can ever come to the Father is through him. We're not good enough. We're not strong enough. We're not wise enough. We're not anything enough to come to God. We are sinners and we are broken and we stand condemned. Fear Him. He is God and we are not. And Marvel. Marvel is not the Marvel comics or the Marvel movies where you have superheroes and things like that. No, it is to be amazed. When was the last time you were amazed? The birth of a child? The death of a friend? The storm that took down the tree? Just amazing, the things that you see. But someone who could say, knock it off, and it calms. That's something 
and someone who can rise from the dead. In fact, and take others with him, be the first fruit of those who belong to God. That's something. Be amazed and marvel. He did it to those who were trying to rob him of his glory, to those who were his enemies. While we were enemies, Christ died for us. Be amazed and be afraid and worship him. As long as we think all religions are the same and that stories like this are throwaway, we will never come to the realization that this Christ is glorious and holy. and awesome and someone to marvel at. We are, we are dealing with Jesus, the Christ of God, the living God. I'd like to end with a hymn. I've been doing that because some of the language of some of the hymns get at things in a way that are so wonderful. Martin Luther was, was a great theologian and he wrote lots of stuff. But he said, you know what, if you really want to get the people, give them the music because you put to words the theology of it and it all fits. And this is one that does. It was written by Edward Hopper, great name, around 1871. He was a pastor. He served in New York Harbor. And his church was known as Church of Sea and Land. And the words are like this. Jesus, Savior, pilot me over life's tempestuous sea. Unknown waves before me roll, hiding rock and treacherous shoal. Chart and compass come from thee, Jesus, Savior, pilot me. As a mother stills her child, thou canst hush the ocean wild. Boisterous waves obey thy will when thou sayst to them, Be still, wondrous sovereign of the sea, Jesus, Savior, pilot me. When at last I near the shore, and the fearful breakers roar, twixt me and the peaceful rest, then while leaning on thy breast, may I hear thee say to me, fear not, I will pilot thee. Isn't that the point? I will pilot thee. I'll see you through the storm. I'll see you all the way through. You know, if we could fear and marvel in that way, we might have a right posture for worship, and worship, when it's done right, brings us into the presence of this King Jesus who is ruling, who is victorious, who is risen from the dead, and someday he will come again, and he will bring us all the way home safely, the pilot, our Savior, our King. Amen. Let us pray. Heavenly Father, we come to you and we give thanks for your Son, Jesus the Christ, who loved us so, that he came into this world and he piloted us through the chart and the compass he's given to us, your word, your grace. We pray, O oh Lord, that you would bless us, that we would not see this as a throwaway passage, but we would marvel and fear and revere and honor and delight in you and in your Son, the King of kings, the Lord of lords, Jesus Christ. Amen. Christ Church, you...
should 